Hi everyone, and welcome to season two of the Becoming Women podcast with me, your host, Ella Sims. My mission with this podcast is to support teenage girls as they navigate the ups and downs of growing up. Each week, I will be speaking with a new female interviewee and asking them what they learned during their teenage years. This season, I will be bringing you female specialists in well-being, mindfulness, authors and young female activists. By speaking with both professionals and inspiring independent women, each individual episode provides you with confidence, tools to handle any challenges you may face, and the reassurance that you are not alone and those tricky teenage years will pass. On today's episode, I am with Fiona Thomas. Fiona is from Birmingham, UK and was diagnosed with depression in 2012 and felt completely lost. She was unable to work for almost a year and turned to blogging in that time, which then became a hobby. However, though it started off as a way to pass the time, Fiona quickly became obsessed with the online world, leading her to experience high levels of anxiety. Now a proud advocate for technology as a communication tool for those of us who suffer the crippling symptoms of mental illness, Fiona has used the internet to help hone her identity and create a supportive community. I couldn't vouch for this more. Fiona's social media feeds are always so lovely, supportive and engaging. Fiona has her own website and is a freelance writer with work published on The Metro, Grazia, Healthline, Heads Together, Mind and Happyful magazine. Her book, Depression in a Digital Age, is an extension of her work and a celebration of all that's possible through the power of social media. I've loved reading it and I keep dipping into it all the time. I really can't wait for you to hear this episode. Hi Fiona and welcome to the Becoming Women podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. You have your own actually called the Positive People podcast. So this isn't a new experience for you. And the podcast, it's all about finding strength in the difficult experiences someone may have had and how that can make things better for you. So mental health is obviously something that's very meaningful to you. When did your own journey start? Um, I suppose it really became an an issue that I couldn't ignore um, in 2012 when I was 26 uh, mm. and I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety. Um, it had gone undiagnosed for a long time so it was it all kind of came uh, crashing down all at once, the diagnosis and the need for um, an extended period of time off work. Um, so yeah, it all kind of it all kind of happened like in a very dramatic fashion <laughs> for me. I had to um, yeah, got diagnosed, took what was supposed to be two weeks off work, uh, ended up being six months off work, and then never ever going back to that job. Mm. So yeah, it was quite intense. Did you you mentioned that you must have been experiencing that a lot earlier on? Can you? pinpoint when that was was that when you were a lot younger so in your childhood or during your teen years I think probably not in my teen years like I think a lot of women would say or I know anyone that's gone through puberty like your teenage years are just so difficult so it's kind of hard to look back and see like was that a tendency for depression and anxiety or was that just you know the complicated world of being a teenager so I can look back and think yeah there are definitely some some dark moments but nothing I don't think that would have that would have given me a kind of red flag for what was to come I think for me it all kind of came after I graduated so I graduated with a degree in commercial music which I have never ever (laughs) put to use Um, it's one of those things that I kind of decided on a whim that I would go and study music at uni and it became apparent quite quickly that I was not passionate enough or um, qualified enough to, to be to, to go into a career in music so after after that like I graduated got my degree and then like most graduates just kind of thought god like I really need to get a job like this all needs to have been worth it and because I'd realized that I didn't want to work in music 
there was this kind of added pressure of like I just felt like well I have to make sure that I don't mess up the rest of my life now because this degree has been kind of a waste so what am I going to do I need to hurry up and make sure that I've got like a proper adult job so I kind of jumped into a career in catering management basically because it was the first thing that came up and worked as a as a store manager at the age of 21 which having not much experience you know in life that that was definitely a bad a bad move on my part um, and I'd basically just worked as a as a manager for three or four years completely un- unqualified and with not any training and basically just went into a, a kind of cycle of of burnout and um, mm. pushing myself to the limits because um, I don't know if you've ever worked in catering but it's kind of long hours um, early mornings late nights and a lot of time on your feet um, a lot of stressful situations like busy lunch periods um you know people phoning in sick and no one to cover you um and a lot of customer facing things so dealing with customer complaints and also dealing with the kind of the team aspect and you know dealing with people who maybe don't turn up on time or relationships that are going on within the work environment so it was just I found it very very stressful for my personality type and after a few years moved on from one company to the next and I'd kind of been on the verge of burnout and not realized it and then left and gone to another job and thought oh this things will be fine now things are fine um and then went through that cycle again um in an even higher up position with a lot more responsibility and there was this was like I say back in 2012 there was zero chat about mental health in the workplace there was no um policies in place for what to do if you thought you were experiencing burnout or had a mental health issue nobody was talking about it so I just kind of burnt myself out and then continued to push myself into the ground and didn't ask for help and didn't even realize that I needed help because I just thought that I was supposed to be an adult and this was what it took to be an adult and I couldn't do what needed to be done so I just thought that I was rubbish at my job and that I was rubbish at being an adult rubbish at keeping my house clean rubbish at keeping on top of my washing rubbish at keeping on top with being a good daughter and a good friend and a good girlfriend um and just felt like I wasn't doing anything right and my kind of solution to that was just to work harder work longer hours you know sleep less and push myself to the brink until all of a sudden I just couldn't couldn't go on anymore and that's when I went to the doctor and said something's not right here and that's when I realized that the burnout had gone on for so long that it led to depression and anxiety basically. You mentioned earlier that you may have had a couple of dark patches during your teenage years would you mind talking about any of those at all? Yeah it's nothing that I can really pinpoint but I'd I just remember having a few kind of angry moments, like moments where I very felt really angry for no reason, and then also feeling quite anxious. There was a couple of times I had a part time job when I was at school, and a couple of times where I felt like I couldn't go to work and I didn't know why. And now I know that that is anxiety, just that fear of that you feel like something's going to, something bad's going to happen, but you don't know why. And at that age, I don't have the the words or the understanding to kind of put that into context or to, to explain what, what, what I felt. So it was really just a couple of moments like that, that looking back, that probably still wasn't enough to warrant, you know, getting help, but it was just a couple of like flashes of what was to come. And if someone sees that happening to them or they can feel it coming on someone who's been through that experience what advice would you have for them it's really hard isn't it because I think the way I dealt with especially the anxiety was just to do the thing anyway and I think if you're suffering from a healthy dose of anxiety then that is a healthy approach Mm -hmm. because if you if I had decided to not go to work it would have exacerbated the problem and then I probably would have never gone back so 
I think it's really it's really difficult. I'm not sure I've got any good advice. <laughs> Other than obviously if it's debilitating, then go to your doctor or talk to someone that you trust. But for me it was it was just little kind of it was just those little things of okay, you're now you're coming into this period of being an adult and you have to do things that are kind of scary. You're creating a really wonderful community online with sharing experiences I know at the moment because I follow you on Instagram and things like that and I know when you're having a day where you're just sort of saying this is too much and I think it's really great to be open like that and maybe you do get people getting in touch with you who say okay yeah I'm going through the same or hang in there. It's not something that I really set out to do like I always say when I started blogging about my own mental health journey, it was purely for selfish reasons. Um, it was my kind of online diary, I guess. Um, I just wanted to not even necessarily document how I feel, but I just wanted to express how I felt. And I felt like at the time that blo- most bloggers were talking about beauty and fashion, and that wasn't something that I was particularly interested in. I just wanted to write about something that was particularly meaningful to me and at that time it was mental health so I just decided to write about it but yeah the response to that was was really positive and it was people from all over the world sending me messages saying um, thanks for writing about this it's really nice to know that other people feel the same way and I think because I kind of wrote about it in quite quite um not necessarily a deep way but I kind of went into the intricacies of how I feel um, it was helpful for people to see it kind of organised and written out in a way that maybe they couldn't have articulated. So not that my experience is the same as anyone else's, but I think people found it in the same way that, you know, if you listen to a song and someone articulates the way you feel in a way that you couldn't ever have said, mm. people people have found it helpful to see it written down. Oh yeah, that that's how I feel and that's it's I thought it was strange but now to see that someone else feels that way as well and that's quite comforting and that's that's what I kind of try to create with my community is I'm not there to give people you know medical advice or I'm not a therapist I'm not trained to give advice to people in that capacity but I know that most people or I would like to think that most people when they're when they need help, they go to their GP or they go to a therapist and they get, you know, the, the medical help that they need. But in between those appointments, there's a need for kind of moral support. And I, I feel like that's where my community kind of thrives is that there's always somebody there saying, this is rubbish, but it's OK, you're, you're going to be OK. So I feel like there's a kind of gap for a lot of people that don't get the validation in between maybe their GP appointments or waiting for their medication to kick in there's there's a space for people to just chat and support each other and lift each other up absolutely and that really nicely leads on to I was wanting to talk to you about your book depression in a digital age and it's a really fantastic account of managing anxiety and being online and on the internet what advantages and disadvantages do you find of of social media? Obviously, with the community you're building, you have people who get in touch with you and they're really positive. Yeah, the the reason that I kind of wanted to write the book came from two books that I read. One um, is Mad Girl by Bryony Gordon and the other one was Control-Alt-Delete by Emma Gannon. Um, Mm -hmm. So one is an account of mental illness and the other is an account of living kind of growing up in the age of the internet and I read them both one after the other and afterwards I thought these these are both amazing books and they both speak to me for different reasons and I felt like there was if there was a Venn diagram my book would be in the middle (laughs) that kind of combined the two aspects and I thought I really want to write about my experience of having a mental illness and kind of documenting that online and how the online world has helped me deal with mental illness in the same way that for some people it is it does hinder their mental health for me the kind of positive aspects have really outweighed the negative and I felt like that was a conversation that I was having with people on Instagram or on Twitter but 
is never ever reflected in the newspapers or on in magazines like it just seems to be like everyone's arguing the complete opposite and I just felt like for me personally that wasn't that didn't ring true so I suppose the the main positive aspect is just is just the community like what we've spoken about um it's having that and I think a lot of people find this online as they find their tribe online in a way that they they can't in real life either because they don't have access to those people because they maybe live um you know remotely they don't have access to kind of diverse communities or just because they're not confident enough to maybe express who they are in real life but online it feels a lot easier and that's definitely how I felt because a lot you know a lot of people think that especially in the age of Instagram that you know who you are on Instagram is fake and who you are in real life that's who you really are but for me coming to terms with living with depression and anxiety I feel like it was the opposite Um, I felt like in real life I pretending to be okay um, and then on Instagram I could be really authentic and really speak truthfully about who I was and and on my blog I could be really honest about um, what I was dealing with day to day so and hopefully now after years of of kind of having a blog and and talking about mental health online I feel like now I've kind of evened that out and now the person that I am in real life, I've brought all my kind of mental health stuff into my real life now and I can talk about it more confidently like this um, on a podcast or face to face with people that I meet on the street. I can be really open about saying, yeah, I've got mental illness, um, but I talk about it quite openly. So for me, social media has been almost like giving me like a space to kind of trial run my new identity as a person with mental illness and then once I got once I realized that you can be open about mental illness um, and it's really positive that's when I realized like okay well now I can talk about this in real life and I can live this kind of identity um, Mm. for real and yeah I think that that's fantastic and also it relates as well to what you do um for your work and as a freelancer as well and going back to the stories that you were talking about before when you were first suffering with anxiety that was all work related so just hearing your story and how it's all come together is is amazing and that wouldn't have been possible without the internet and without platforms like Instagram yeah exactly and you were also talking about how being online that made you feel better and gave you the space to be who you really were and how you were really feeling do you think that that's a potential sign to look out for if say online is damaging your mental health and I guess it would be flipped you're feeling okay in person but being online it's making you feel a a certain way or it's feeling you making you feel negative about yourself yeah obviously that's that's the big thing isn't it is if you if you kind of if you're using social media and you come away feeling worse than when you opened the app, then that's a red flag. In the same way that you shouldn't be getting all your positive energy from there, you don't want to be getting all your negative energy from there either. It should be, it should be the kind of place that you can dip in and out of without without having a drastic effect on your mood. Like um, in the same way, like I have this big thing with email that whenever I open my email. I don't want it to affect my mood so I'd only open my email when I'm like emotionally uh, ready (laughs) because it's kind of just yeah if you're feeling vulnerable you you wouldn't walk up to your worst enemy and say like tell me what you really think (laughs) Um, so don't yeah don't open yourself up to anything can happen when you open an app you just don't know what you're going to find because who's going to comment on your your content but also like the people that you follow even if you follow people that you love and respect you just don't know what they're going to post Um, and people aren't always great about um, you know trigger warnings and even it could be something that they don't realize is going to trigger you Um, like Mm -hmm. if I'm feeling particularly I don't know like if I'm feeling like oh my business isn't doing that well I'm not making enough money and then I go on and see that someone that I know and really love has just sold like a million books then that's good obviously that's not they don't know that that's going to trigger me but it's going to make me feel it's just going to 
make me feel worse than when I opened the app. So it's um I think it all comes down to being more in tune with your emotions before you start dabbling in social media. Mm-hmm. And that takes practice, unfortunately. It just takes a lot of practice of kind of, you know, sitting with your feelings and accepting them and working through how you can change that kind of negative voice in your head that tells you you're not good enough and that you've not done enough. It's how can you kind of tune into that and take steps to to you be in control of that narrative as opposed to it being affected by external sources. Yeah, I was going to ask you what your thoughts are and how you can use it in a in a positive way. Yeah, it, well, you know, it's that the thing that everyone says is curate your feed. You're in control of who you follow. And if, you know, I am a big, big fan of the mute button. Um, I will mute people. And it's never people that are, I mean, I don't really follow people that put out negative or what I feel to be like negative messages anyway. Um, but I will mute people who are making me feel rubbish about myself. But it's on, It's always an issue that I need to work through. It's never, ever anything to do with that person. It's always people who are like on holiday all the time <laughs> or people who, like I say, people who are making a lot of money or people who... Um, I don't know, I'm jealous of their hair. <laughs> it's just silly <laughs> things that it's my issue that I need to work through. So I just find it easier to mute people and let them live their life without me kind of having all these unnecessary negative feelings. And then I try and work through them myself. But yeah, also, as well as kind of trying to follow people that make you feel good, is um, just talking to people. Like, you know, social media is there for you to be social it's not just about posting content and then walking away so give as many compliments and positive feedback to people that you follow as you can you know and if someone especially people who you can tell put in a lot of work to their to their platforms like maybe they give a lot of, give away a lot of um, free video content or free resources or advice you know just pop on and say thank you like um, you know that's the great thing about social media is that it's generally unless it's a big brand or a big celebrity you know the person that runs that account is there reading the dm so just pop on and say like thanks so much for what you do i really enjoy it and it's just nice to make social media actually social yes and i feel like that's that's more validating than a like or a follow is just having a conversation with someone yeah putting in the time to speak with people and and socialize yeah absolutely you recently wrote a blog post on how to pitch to have a piece written um, or published. If there are any young girls listening to this and thinking of doing something like that, what would you share with them? Hmm, I would say start by definitely starting up your own blog. It's so, so easy. I, you know, for somebody who's written about the digital age, I am not very good (laughs) at digital things um, so when I set up my blog I thought god I, I don't know how I'm going to do this and it, it really is so easy you can get free free platforms free templates um, so yeah just set one up and start writing and don't um, don't worry about other people reading it because in the beginning nobody will read it um, it's, you know unless you're publicizing it on your platforms then it just exists on the internet and generally nobody will come across it because there's so many blogs so just use it as a way to experiment and practice and keep writing um, and read as much as you can you know read the websites that you want to write for make sure you read them um, follow the editors follow the sub editors follow the writers follow them on twitter and read what they write and you'll get to know what kind of topics people are looking for um, and how they're structured and how to write in a way that captivates the reader and don't necessarily make every story about you you've got to kind of bring in other case studies and talk about how a specific topic affects like the wider community and the world so definitely yeah read and write as much as as you possibly can and then when you want to start pitching read that blog read that blog post that I wrote because it's really really detailed it's all about making sure that your story is an actual story Uh, you, you know there's no point in pitching an idea that's for example, 10 ways to deal with anxiety, those kind of posts 
although they are written, they're gen- generally written by kind of staff writers or people that already work for a publication. So if you want to get your story published, you kind of have to, you have to prove to the editor and the publication that you're the only person that can write that story. So whether it's you've got a really unique viewpoint or you've got a really, um, you've got access to case studies or statistics um, on a particular story, you've got to make sure that they that they've got to hire you to write the piece. I'll um, make sure I link the blog post to the show notes. <laughs> yeah, because that's the one thing that I get asked the most. So that's why I wrote a blog post about it because it's really it's not it's not particularly like what I've written there is not new. Like you can find all that information, um, but it's really hard to explain just in a conversation how to go about it because there's a mm-hmm. few different steps involved. So it's about yeah, like finding the right people to talk to and making sure that your story is actually a story. And then there's there's a pitch template as as well. So it's you know it gives you examples of emails that I have sent that have been that have resulted in commissions. So it gives you because that's the thing that I struggled with at the start was how to actually write a pitch email because everybody will give out all the other advice, but nobody would get would actually show you a successful email. So I've included that so that you can see what works. <laughs> and then what they'll need to do is say hello and thank you on your instagram (laughs) yes yes please do or comment on the blog post or whatever absolutely i have a series of fun quick fire questions for you if you're ready okay so who was your teen crush oh oh stephen gately r.i.p and first kiss oh god I don't even want to give him a name. <laughs> it was like it was like a peck on the cheek from someone in my class. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and moving on, um, what about favourite song or a song that defined your teenage years? Oh, Wannabe by the Spice Girls. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I ask all guests uh, two final questions. Looking back and knowing what you know now, what would you advise your younger self? What would you want to tell her? I think I would say, it's a bit of a cliche, but just stay weird. Stop <laughs> stop trying to... I mean, I, I did... I think I did kind of stay pretty weird. <laughs> but don't, um, don't worry about what everyone else is doing and whatever strange passions and strange interests that you've got don't worry about them being different from everyone else and just kind of stick with it um, because that's what's going to make you unique in the long run. And don't mould yourself so that you fit in with something that you feel like you should. Yeah, exactly. Just, yeah, because I remember when I was, when I started writing about mental health, um, there was no blogging opportunities. There was no um, brands are looking to work with bloggers. Nobody was talking about wellness or mental health. And I remember thinking, like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm so glad I stuck with it. Um, because if you're passionate about something, then eventually, like, your time will come to shine. That's great. And if you could give a gift to teenage girls all over the world, anything, what would you want to give them? I think I would give them a book. I'd give them um, Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. Because have you ever read it? No, I haven't. It's all about, I guess it's a self-help book, it's all about um, how everybody is creative, we're all creative, and how to kind of harness that creativity, and how the, the big message I took from it was that if you're a creative person and you, you make things, it's more important that you finish them and you put them out into the world than make them perfect. Um, mm-hmm. And I, that that's really helped me with all of my work, is just, you know, just do the thing, put it out into the world and then move on to the next thing because there's you'll never ever make something perfect or something that you're a hundred percent happy with yeah because yeah. as a as a creative person you're probably a perfectionist as well so it's never ever going to be perfect so just get it get it ready and send it out and that's that that's great I really like that <laughs> well thank so, you Fiona. um sorry did you want to say something else I was just going to say you should read that book it's, it's such a good book 
it's one of those yeah. books that you can read again and again especially if you're about to embark on something creative or if you're at like a bit of a crossroads just in life and you, it's, it's really really good okay I'll have to make sure that I get that mm-hmm. <laughs> find a quiet moment to read a few chapters yeah perfect well thank you Fiona it's been brilliant speaking with you today thanks for having me you're welcome thank you thanks Thank you so much for listening to Becoming Women with me, Ella Sims. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please follow me on Twitter or Instagram or visit www.becomingwomen.com. I'd love it if you could please share this podcast with anyone you know who would enjoy listening to it. And if you are a young girl, I'd love to hear your feedback on today's episode. So feel free to send me a DM. See you next week.